As we begin, let's just say a prayer. <clears throat> Almighty God, who has given us thine only begotten Son to take our nature upon him and to be born of a pure virgin, grant that we, being regenerate and made thy children by adoption and grace, may daily be renewed by thy Holy Spirit, through the same our Lord Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with thee, with the same Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Well, yes, indeed, we are going to, in this first section, first session today, talk about Emmanuel, about the Incarnation, and then later on this afternoon to talk about the exaltation of the Son of God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. With this becoming and dwelling, this plenitude of grace and truth that John speaks of there, this showing of the inner divine glory, we reach the decisive episode in the history of redemption. The presence of God incarnate is that to which all previous covenant history leads and that from which all subsequent history flows. It is therefore a point of particular theological responsibility, the test case for a right ordering of perfection and presence. If a theology which seeks to take seriously the distinction between uncreated and created is to prove its Christian title, it must be here as nowhere else. Above all, it needs to be shown that a theology of God's perfection is not a matter of dominance by abstract, in Christological terms, Nestorian separation of God and creatureliness. No, such a theology simply seeks to trace the manner of God's presence in Jesus Christ as it's set out for us by the apostolic witnesses. Because at some important points, my account of the matter is not really companionable with some authoritative contemporary Christological conventions, it's obviously exposed to the dangers of reactive overemphasis and resultant disproportion. While no theology can proceed without reaching some judgments of circumstance, that is, decisions about what needs to be said in a given setting, sometimes what needs to be corrected in a given setting. In watching for the potential distortions which these decisions can generate, the systematic character of dogmatics is especially important because its concern for scope, range, and the placement of particular tracts of Christian teaching can protect us against the hypertrophy or the atrophy in expounding revelation. Incarnation and redemption are, of course, co-inherent topics in Christian teaching. In investigating them, we're inquiring into the one integral history of Jesus Christ from two vantage points, that of the identity of the personal agent of this history and that of the task which is given to this one to perform. The distinction of person and work has only expository justification. And at each point in a full Christology, the integration of these two vantage points would have to be secured. Uh, in today's lecture, the constraints are such that the work of Christ will only, in fact, appear as a matter which keeps obtruding into the discussion, but can't be addressed directly. But my focus on the dogmatics of incarnation ought not to be taken as a suggestion that these considerations exhaust what theology has to say by way of an encomium on Emmanuel. Person and office are mutually constitutive and interpretive. Moreover, because the identity and activity of the incarnate one cohen here, then the full scope of the assumption of flesh cannot be known apart from its goal, which is the renewal of creature to fellowship with God. So the metaphysics of incarnation is neither a discrete and self-sufficient theological topic, nor just speculative ballast to a theology of reconciliation. It is a way by which theological reason, attending to the presence of Christ, identifies the eternal divine energy of the covenant of salvation. <coughs> so, to begin the exposition. The Church confesses that at a particular time and in a particular place, there occurred a human history to which God gives the name Emmanuel. The Church lives in and from the presence of Jesus Christ now, 
but his presence as the church's contemporary always includes a retrospective dynamic, since it is anchored in his presence there and then, and only by that anchorage can his present identity and relation to the church be known. It's for this reason that the gospel requires the gospels, which set out his presence there and then in its mysterious openness to the future, and which set all futures in relation to his past. Emmanuel, therefore, reaches back into the divine perfection and forward into the historical future. What is indicated by the name? Well, the reality so named is a human life, a sequence of events clustering around, clustering around an agent, his acts and his sufferings. In this history, we're dealing with happenings in time and space, birth, embodiment, learning, relations, society, culture, religion, power. That is, with created human existence. Historians of Jesus rightly sought to recall our attention to such matters, even though they sometimes did so to knock dogma from its throne or to promote Jesus as an exalted moral instructor. One of the consequences, sorry, one consequence of the extraordinary prestige of historical reconstruction of Jesus is, however, the danger of believing that a necessary assertion about the humanity of Jesus is Christologically sufficient, or at least basic. And the apostolic witness, it seems to me, goes in a different direction. In the evangelical narratives, Jesus' human history is a history with depth. That is, it emerges from and returns to that which is other than created time. In its familiarity, it is shot through with the absolute, as in a direct and immediate way, its condition of possibility. This history, and the agent of this history, has, as Calvin notes in a comment on the opening verse of John's Gospel, it has an inner existence of which it is an open or outward manifestation. Its secret, in other words, that by virtue of which it is what it is, lies outside temporality. Its existence, if you want, rests on pre-existence. Jesus' history is not trapped within the network of causality and suffering in which all other histories are caught. It is a history which has to be spoken of as a coming and a being sent, as an earthly career originating in heaven. And so, therefore, it is free. Jesus' human career transcends its immediate circumstances in all its dealings with them, and does so effortlessly. Even when that history appears to be overcome by the regime of sin in the Passion, what is displayed, of course, is not helplessness, but self-restraint, self-giving, self-command. Jesus' history is the history of the kingdom, the rule of God. There is, of course, no sense that the subject of this lordly history is not a human being. Yet there is a curious coexistence and interpenetration of the transcendent and the familiar, which makes it both entirely natural and utterly strange. Well, that's an initial indication of the character of this special incommensurable history to which the name Emmanuel is given. What may we say by way of expansion? Well, first, we'd want to say that Jesus' history is the central episode in the unfolding of God's covenant with creatures. In this one, the word of God comes to his own. That means that the larger history of which the career of Jesus forms part is not only that of the overall course of human affairs, though it's that also, nor is what takes place in him only a further modulation of the history of antique religion. These realities are its circumstances, its occasion and setting in the world. But his relation to those circumstances is such that he comes to them, not such that they enclose him. His coming is the decisive unfolding of the history of redemption. It is covenant history, embracing and entering and recreating world history. 
the creation, of course, is from within. It's by a human career and not by an epiphany. But it is within history only in fulfilment of the will of the Lord of the Covenant. In this history, Israel's God is present and active redemptively to order the affairs of creatures. Second, therefore, this special history is a full and genuine and human history because of the divine purpose therein enacted, namely the restoration of covenant fellowship with God. The humanity of the history, the fact that we're dealing with a human history here, we should note, is essential because of its telos, that is, because of the task to be accomplished. It's not a human history in order to satisfy some requirement on our part for revelation on our terms. Restoration of fellowship requires this divine act of fellowship. If, therefore, there is this human history, it is because, again, this is Calvin, our most merciful Father decreed what was best for us. It was necessary for the Son of God to become for us Emmanuel, that is, God with us, and in such a way that his divinity and our human nature might, by mutual connection, grow together. What Calvin's getting towards, it seems to me, is that the humanity of the history of Jesus is a function of the divine task, which, again in Calvin's words, is so to restore us to God's grace as to make of the children of men children of God. This, not some supposed ontological primacy of human history, is the logic of the very homo, the true man. Third, to follow this through, we have to press further back. If the historical presence of Jesus is the central episode in the covenant, then it flows, we might say, from the eternal pact which God makes with himself to be the Lord of the covenant and graciously to summon creatures into fellowship with himself. Put abstractly, Jesus' history is not accidental history. This is first because it's not a self-directed enactment, it is obedience to the will of another, the will of him who sent me, as we read in John. And second, Jesus' history enacts a divine decision. In it, according to Ephesians 1, the divine purpose is set forth or realised. What's being brought to manifestation, therefore, in his history is something which was destined before the foundation of the world. Even the deliverance of Jesus to crucifixion is according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. That means that Jesus' history, far from being accidental, is supremely necessary history. Fourth, by way of indication of this necessary character, Jesus' history, as it's presented to us by the evangelists, is framed by signs or mysteries in which its depth is, in a certain way, made visible and apprehensible. These are the signs of the virginal conception of Jesus and his resurrection. At its temporal beginning, at its temporal end, Jesus' history is bracketed off from all other creaturely occurrence. Its genuine human historicity is a kind of interstice, that is, it comes down from heaven and it ascends to the Father. It is unconfined, therefore. Its agent is not wholly contained within its temporal span. Those who say that the flesh was like a home to Christ have not grasped the evangelist's thought, comments Calvin on John's and dwelt among us. He does not ascribe a permanent residence among us to Christ, Calvin goes on, but says that he stayed for a time as a guest. The temporary character of the words visitation doesn't of course mean that he's not our contemporary, that he's absented himself after a fleeting historical presence. No, quite the opposite. The ending of his earthly presence is the condition for his universal self-bestowing presence. And this too is part of the sheer difference of Jesus' history. 
Well, we can sum up what's been said so far about the history of Emmanuel with a passage from Bart, uh, from whom I've largely refrained from quoting, but this is a good bit. Jesus' history, he says, is the new time which arises and has its place because God reveals himself, because he is free for us, because he is with us and amongst us, because, in short, without ceasing to be what he is, he also became what we are. The time God has for us is constituted by his becoming present to us in Jesus Christ. If we say Jesus Christ, we also assert a human and therefore temporal presence, but the time we mean when we say Jesus Christ is not to be confused with any other time. That's from um, Dogmatics 1-2. Or more tersely, with Calvin, who got to the point always much more quickly than Bart ever managed to, Christ, he says, must not be reduced to the common order of the world. Now, the point of all this, I think, is to say that incarnate presence is not historical imminence. A dogmatic to Emmanuel doesn't commit theology to a change of direction away from God's perfection, nor does it lead to a relaxation of God's inaccessibility, God becoming historically available. There is none like thee among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like thine, the psalmist says. And incarnate presence doesn't erase the difference which the perfect God is. It identifies the point at which it becomes visible in time. This suggests some reasons why research into the history of Jesus has proved and continues to prove itself to be, by and large, dogmatically and spiritually sterile. As someone said, it studies a topic which does not exist, namely, a history of Jesus which, for the purposes of rational inquiry, can be isolated from its divinely given name of Emmanuel. At the very least, if such inquiry were to lead to knowledge of the essence of Jesus' history, it would need to overcome fearsome obstacles. The relentless reductive pressure and the profanity of the history of religion, the hegemony of the principle of historical analogy, which makes difference something to be overcome, disallowance of anything other than imminent historical causality. And further, Historical inquiry in this mode can scarcely avoid being an attempt to evade or at least suspend Jesus' self-explication which he offers us through his apostolic heralds. The Gospels are gospel. They are solemn proclamation of the grace revealed in Christ. Only accidentally are they documents of religious development or sources. The history which they present the history of Emmanuel, is not simply an historical magnitude. It is the special visibility of the perfect God. Know this, says Augustine, that all those things which were seen in bodily form were not the substance of God, for we saw those things with the eyes of the flesh. How is the substance of God seen? Well, of course, if you quote Augustine to some kinds of historians of the New Testament, you unleash a torrent of criticism. Uh, believe me, I will show you the scars. A Christologically uncorrected God, they say. An opposition of flesh and substance, and much else besides. But the criticisms miss Augustine's point. Augustine has no hesitation in saying, if on account of his flesh the Son was visible, that we also grant it is the Catholic faith. But visibility is not the same as entire transparency or availability for inspection or objectifiability. In the history of Jesus, we are in the order of signs. That which is given to be visible in the sign of the flesh of Jesus is that which becomes flesh. It emerges into, vis into visibility from the abyss of the Word's life in himself, which he has from the Father. These categories, becoming flesh, the Word's life in himself, from the Father, these categories are not speculative moves away from the history of Jesus. They are simply sober indications of what that history is. An approach to the history of Jesus, apart from Emmanuel, 
is therefore, I think, closed to the Christian confession. His history only truly becomes a matter for rational apprehension when that name is invoked. The word became flesh and dwelt among us is as basic to Jesus' history as, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee. So our next task, therefore, is to attempt some kind of explication of the history of Jesus as the event in which the word became flesh. Before taking it up, however, I, I want to ponder a little further an objection to the kind of account which I'm advocating, namely the objection that it's overwhelmed by a theology of God's timeless perfection which it tries to keep uncontaminated by qualifying Christ's temporal presence. The objection, of course, is familiar in some recent Lutheran Christology, but it was anticipated 40 years ago in Dietrich Ritschel's remarkable book, Memory and Hope, for my money at least, one of the few truly impressive dogmatic treatments of the presence of Christ from the last half century. Ritschel fears that theology in the Western tradition, burdened, as he says, by its Augustinian heritage, has little place for the presence of Christ. Augustinianism is kind of portmanteau term in Ritchell's book. It, it indicates a cluster of harmful theological commitments, among them the concept of a timeless God, the negative evaluations of ordinary world history, and the idea that God's decisive actions lie in the past. The result is what Ritchell calls an acute phrase, the absence of the present Christ, i.e., Revelation is conceived as a past event, it's present now only in some kind of charismatic or sacramental reenactment of what God has already revealed in a finished act in the past. Ritchell's preferred solution to this bifurcation of transhistorical revelation and ordinary world history is ecclesiological. That is, he suggests that the worshipping church now is the location of Christ's self-communicative presence. The presence of this one is not the presence of what Ritual calls the historical resurrected Christ, that is one whose effective history is felt as a kind of long-range consequence of a past event. No, Christ is risen and therefore present. But, he goes on, such affirmations require disengagement from the metaphysics of Two Natures Christology, which, in Ritchell's judgment, fails to accord to Jesus' history any constitutive significance for the doctrine of God. Hence, quote, the possibility that the pre-existent, the incarnate, as well as the post-existent Christ, is to be seen in the light of Christ present, did not seriously enter into traditional Christology. The idea that God in Jesus Christ has a history frightened the theologians because it was seen as detrimental to the concept of the timelessness of God and because it appeared to be in proximity to the economic understanding of the Trinity. Thus, it was only Jesus Christ who was conceived as having a history. Well, what do we make of all that? Some of Ritchell's criticism seemed to me beyond contest. Above all, his exposure of a certain reluctance to allow much work to be done by the exalted Christ. One could, for example, write a persuasive history of modern hermeneutics as a symptom of declining attention to Christ's communicative presence. But Ritchell's generalities, Augustinianism and Western theology, don't really serve him very well. And they tend to glide over counterexamples, like Calvin's account of church ministry, or Barth's theology of the prophetic office, both of which are, of course, deeply committed to talking about Christ's presence. And there is a deeper dogmatic problem, I think, in what Ritchell's arguing. This is that, as presented by Ritchell, Christ present, Christus presence, is amorphous, largely because Ritchell doesn't work through some basic questions about the finished identity of Christ and about the relation of Christ's agency to that of the church. Furthermore, Ritchell, rather surprisingly for someone who's a patristic scholar, fails to see that the real tenor of classical Christological metaphysics 
was not to promote an abstract opposition of eternity and time, but rather to indicate the perfect divine movement, which is the order in which Jesus has his historical being. In terms of our theme, that is, Ritual assumes that presence can be secured only by subtracting from perfection. But most of all, I think, that's because he lacks a theology of the imminent life of the triune God as the condition, not the contradiction, of God's temporal presence. And to explore how this might be so, how the imminent life of the triune God is the condition of God's temporal appearance, we turn to reflect on the apostolic confession, which stands at the head of the gospel history, the confession that the word became flesh. First then, the word became flesh. What takes place in and as the history of Jesus is the fleshly presence of the eternally perfect word of God. The active subject of this history is the divine word, who participates unreservedly in the divine nature because in the beginning he was with and was God. This is the one encountered in and as Jesus' history. In, because he's not exhausted by that history, but freely present in it by assumption. As, because the words uniting of himself to the flesh of Jesus means his real union with it. But the question is, what kind of union between word and flesh? The movement of incarnation is a repetition and confirmation of the lordship of the word of God, his true deity and aseity as the eternal son. The entire history of Jesus, therefore, takes place within the sphere of the word's majesty. The traditional sequential arrangement of the two states of Christ, though of course it can be helpful in articulating the historical movement set out in the Gospels and summarised in Philippians 2, for example, can actually suppress a dogmatically important point. Namely, that this temporal progression um, from uh, his coming down to his exaltation, that this temporal progression is underlain by the words changeless and fully accomplished glory. The state of humiliation the abasement of the one who assumes to himself the wretchedness and misery of sin-laden humanity is grounded in the Son's eternal exaltation. His exaltation at the close of his temporal career confirms, but it doesn't for the first time establish, the glory which he had with the Father before the world was made. The incarnation, therefore, entails no loss of deity on the part of the Word. Whatever we may go on to say about kenosis, most people go on to say far too much, it seems to me, whatever we may go on to say about kenosis can only be a consequence and extension of the word's fully realised agency. He himself empties himself. He is not ensnared by time, but makes himself present in it with indefatigable freedom, with a lordship that does not fear flesh, because it is effortlessly beyond corruption. Now, a negation and an affirmation need to be made here. The negation is that the incarnation of God does not rest upon a creaturely movement. It's not just part of the world process, nor is it the actualization of creaturely potential. The confession that the word became flesh indicates a unidirectional movement, not the coordination of two actions, one from the divine word and one from the creature. The word does not annex to itself some already existent or potentially existent creaturely reality. This, of course, is the force of talk of the anhypostatic and enhypostatic humanity of Jesus Christ. That doctrine is only superficially deceitic. It's not a claim that the history of Jesus has no real human dynamic. No, it's just an indication of the divine condition for there being such a human dynamic. This one, Jesus, is unreservedly a man, and he is such because and only because of the divine word in whose becoming he has his being. There is therefore 
we might say, an abyss in the human history of Jesus, by virtue of which he exists and acts with exceeding freedom. The corresponding affirmation, therefore, is that this excess in Jesus' history is to be traced to the words relation to the Father. He was in the beginning with God. Only because this is so is there a history of Jesus, which we may name Emmanuel. In Trinitarian terms, the incarnate presence of the Son has its deep ground in his active submission to the Father's will. It enacts the Son's concord with the Father in the covenant of redemption, and that in turn is rooted in the procession of the Son from the Father. An affirmation along these lines is not, as John Milbank alleges, a matter of trying to rescue the story of Jesus from sheer contingency by some theory of divine mission. No, it's simply a matter of observing that story in its full scope as it's presented to us by the apostolic witness. The movement of incarnation flows from the eternal Father as its first mover and from the eternal Son who consents to the Father's will in accordance with his, the Son's, character. It is a genuine human history, therefore, insofar as it is the enactment in time of eternal relations. The obe- this is uh, uh, John Edwards, I think. The obedience which the Son of God performs to the Father, even in the affair of man's redemption, or as redeemer and mediator before his humiliation, and also that obedience he performs as God-man after his humiliation, when, as God-man, he is exalted to the glory he had before, is no more than flows from his economical office or character. Economical there, of course, in Edwards, refers to the inner order of God's being, not to the, um, the economy of God's external works. So first then, the Word became flesh. Second, the Word became flesh. Well, became here has to be understood pretty strictly on the basis of this event and this agent, because, like everything else in incarnational metaphysics, borrowed terms serve only when adapted and bent to new purposes. This becoming does not entail a surrender of the deity of the word. It's rather a matter of its specification, its closer characterization in the wake of its manifest self-enactment. Without ceasing to be God, without renunciation of the aseity which he shares with Father and Spirit, (coughs) the Word is also the agent of this human temporal reality. The Logos en sarcos, the Logos in flesh, does not mean that the Logos a sarcos, the Logos without flesh, is set aside. It doesn't mean that the Word is imprisoned within finitude there is that which is extra carnem, outside the flesh. But what's at stake in this assertion of an extra, an outside? It's not, as it were, a way of holding some portion of the Logos in reserve, as if deity required protection against degradation by the flesh. God's perfection does not need to be shielded in this way. Rather, the so-called Calvinistic extra identifies the externality of the word's relation to the history of Jesus. It indicates the word's freedom. The incarnation is a free act of becoming, an act of holy, spontaneous, divine love. But again, this freedom of God is not independence, not therefore maintained only by aloofness from the flesh. No, God's freedom is the perfect, self-derived and self-determining power with which God loves himself, including loving himself by loving creatures and coming to their aid as their redeemer. By the eternal divine counsel, the word is directed to creatures. It is the verbum incarnandus, the word to become incarnate. But this to be incarnate is again not in opposition to the logos asarkos, the word without flesh. That the word is from eternity determined to be made flesh rests on the anterior fullness of God's life in which the word shares. So the incarnation does not, as it were, complete the word's life. It it stretches it forth in the mission 
which reiterates the eternal procession of the Son from the Father. With the words becoming flesh, the relation between word and flesh is therefore asymmetrical and irreversible. The word is self-existent, flesh is creaturely. The flesh is a function of the word, but the word is not a function of the flesh. Egenator, Bart notes in his remarkable early exposition of the Johannine prologue, is the sign equating hologos and sarx. But he continues, there is a restriction here. Hologos must remain subject and sarx the predicate. The logos is what he is even without the predicate. The flesh exists only as the predicate of the subject logos. Again, however, we've got to ensure that this understanding of becoming, with these rather strict demarcations between word and flesh, even in their relation, we have to make sure that this understanding of becoming isn't driven by an abstract opposition of finite and infinite. The abstraction, of course, is not always very far from the surface when reform Christology appeals to the maxim that the finite is not capable of the infinite. That's a rather unstable maxim, it seems to me, and one which rather easily converts itself into the opposite maxim, the infinite is not capable of the finite. The perfect God of the Christian confession is no such abstract infinite. Dogmatics in the sphere of divine revelation follows the rule, what God does, he can do. Because the word became flesh, the word is capable of this act. And I think it's precisely this, which at its best, Reformed Christology has tried to affirm, namely the divine capacity, a capacity not wholly expended in the act of incarnation, but remaining full and free. Third, therefore, the word became flesh. The flesh which the word becomes is also of the essence of the confession of the gospel. It is, at least for First John, a mark by which we know whether a spirit is of God. The word <coughs> does not undertake his work remotely as a kind of unrelated office bearer. He does it as one who makes himself the brother of lost children. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same nature. This partaking involves the word's election for himself of non-identical fellowship with creatures. Jesus isn't simply a creaturely mediator through whom the word acts, but with whom the word has no substantial unity. Nor is the incarnation an epiphany of pure spirit, visible in the transfigured flesh of Jesus, perhaps, but not as that flesh. No, incarnation means that theology can't rest content with received demarcations of created and uncreated. Because the word became flesh, theology cannot isolate knowledge of God from God in Jesus Christ. The humanity which the word assumes is of constitutive, not merely instrumental significance. The eternal decree, therefore, is fulfilled by the new Adam, one who bears our flesh. Otherwise, the evangelical narratives are mere pretense. If we to edge towards the mystery of the words partaking of flesh and blood, however, we have to say first that it's something which can't be deduced from our understanding of what it is to be human. According to that understanding, Humanity cannot be derived from anything other than humanity. To speak of a flesh which the word has become, in the sense we've outlined, is simply not to speak of anything classifiably human. But it's at just this point that the a priori character of incarnational teaching has to be recognised. The object of that teaching, the word made flesh, just follows its own law. Becoming flesh, or assumption, mean here and nowhere else there takes place a genuine human history which is by virtue of the word. A history in which word and flesh are not competing designations, but wholly complementary and wholly necessary. As with pre-existence and historical existence, so here. Word 
and creatureliness do not compete. Word can become flesh without diminution of either. Second, therefore, the word's relation to the flesh which it becomes is explicable only in the instance of its occurrence. That is, to use the technical patristic terms, as a hypostatic union and not a union of natures. In speaking of incarnation, we are speaking of Jesus Christ and him alone. Now here, once again, some distinctions are necessary. The union of word and flesh is not co-essentiality, as between the persons of the Trinity, since in the incarnation there is no common nature which is shared. Nor is it a union in which each supplies a particular component, since everything derives unilaterally from the word. Anything else just risks being adoptionist. Rather, in the incarnational union, at the word's sole initiative, deity and humanity come together in the one historical subject, Jesus Christ, and only there. Now, this emphasis on hypostatic rather than natural union prevents the diffusion of incarnation into moral or sacramental or ecclesial or experiential repeatability. The word's presence is identified as the presence of this one. Application of divine properties like ubiquity to the flesh, as in the Lutheran uh, genus uh, Majestaticum, can only lead to the dispersal of the word into the flesh. Because of this, third, the union of word and flesh is not such that the difference of the natures is overcome. The integrity of each is retained without change or confusion. But this, in turn, isn't just a matter of a simple temporary co-presence of word and flesh. No, they are together without division or separation. Now, a great deal hangs on understanding these Chalcedonian privatives in the right way. They're not a thing to be understood as a set of mutually conditioning abstractions, nor are they a suggestion that deity and humanity are co-constitutive in the incarnation. Rather, they're kind of conceptual traces of the ordered movement of the words becoming flesh. In that movement, without change, without confusion, has a certain priority because of the primacy of the divine subject, whose taking flesh doesn't mean unrestricted self-communication. Yet, without separation and without division, necessarily follows from that, because the flesh which the word assumes is indeed gathered into the word's identity. It's not merely remotely or instrumentally employed. Word and flesh are really but asymmetrically related. Flesh does not become word. Word does not collapse into flesh. Now, this is not, I think, to fall back into the Nestorian or Zwinglian separation of God and creation so deplored by many contemporaries. Well, I hope it's not to fall back into that. The redemptive effectiveness of Jesus' spirit-directed human struggle and his victory over sin enjoys some considerable prominence these days, of course, doesn't it? Especially amongst readers of John Owen. Especially amongst those who discover in John Owen something which accords with the twofold structure of the covenant. These accounts trouble me a bit, I have to say. They're often exegetically underdetermined, particularly in their pneumatology, and they commonly undervalue the retrospective component of a theology of the word made flesh, that is, its reach back into eternity. In my judgment, at least, a great deal hangs on retaining this retrospective element as an operative factor in a theology of incarnation. Without it, the presence of God in Christ loses something of its incomprehensible difference. He who has seen me has seen the Father. No one has ever seen God. The only Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has made him known. Now, I think a theology of the incarnate presence of the perfect God has to observe and be ruled by the tension between those two verses, which is not abolished even in the coming of the Son to the world. Well, commenting on the opening phrase of the fourth gospel, Calvin says that in these words, the evangelist asserts that we do not forsake the one eternal God when we believe in Christ, and also that life is now restored to the dead, 
through the kindness of him who was the source and cause of life when nature was yet sound. Notice what's happening there. Calvin characteristically envisages teaching about the incarnation to comprise first the son's eternal deity and then second his gift of life. The first as source, the second as goal of his historical presence. Well, most of what I've been setting out so far has been preoccupied with the first of Calvin's elements, namely the eternal deity of the subject of the gospel history. Let me close with some all too brief comments on the soteriological correlates of the hypostatic union. By the name Emmanuel, Aquinas tells us, the cause of salvation is signified, which is the union of divine and human nature in the person of the Son of God, through whom it came about that God was with us by sharing in our nature. Well, as for Calvin, so for Aquinas. The word made flesh is God with us, and as such, the cause of salvation. Knowledge of Jesus Christ as the presence of God embraces both those realities, and all other things being equal, it actually makes little material difference if we approach the metaphysics of incarnation through the work, or give our attention first to the subject of the work. What matters is just that we do justice to both terms of the confession. That being said, there are, I think, prudential reasons for choosing to place the person of Christ at the head of a contemporary account of Jesus Christ. A common weakness of accounts of Jesus Christ oriented to soteriology, especially, but not exclusively, in bits of the mainstream Protestant tradition since Kant, is that they demonstrate an insecure grasp of the fact that Jesus' human being and history are what they are by virtue of the freedom of the eternal word of God. This weakness is shared, for example, by the solemn moral Christologies of the high liberal tradition. Their grandeur, of course, should never be underestimated. And it's also shared by those rather lush dramatic Christologies in which the events of Jesus' history are treated as immediate, unproblematical presentations of the being of God. Both operate with an attenuated sense that the flesh of Jesus is a predicate of the world's becoming. In both, perfection is eclipsed by presence as an element in the temporal world. Well, if I take a different direction, I've not done so, I think, on extrinsicist principles, that is, pulling away from God's saving presence in history, but just to try to mark out that history's cause, that is, to try to draw attention to that which is in Jesus' history by which limitless transcendent resources are brought to bear upon creatures in the affair of their redemption. This is Rowan Williams. Jesus' human life is shot through with God's. He is carried on a tide of God's eternal life and borne towards us on that tide, bringing with him all the fullness of the Creator. Well, a theology of Emmanuel such as I've sketched would need to be filled out by an account of Jesus' human life, passion and death as the historical form of that tide of God's eternal life reaching out to us with saving power. Such an account would be, in essence, an exegesis of the writings of the evangelists and the other ap apostolic interpreters in the context of the canon as a whole. Exegesis, note, not the reconstruction of the history of early Christian traditions or worship or culture, but the explication of the texts in which Christ, now present to the church, elucidates himself. Well, what very briefly might such an account show about the human history of Jesus? In summary form, it might draw attention to the following factors in the words dwelling among us. First, Jesus' human history is the enactment of his office. In it, he follows the task given to him, ultimately in the eternal relation of father and son, proximately manifest at his baptism. His history is not casual, directionless, or self-directed. It is a history lived in accordance with the divine must, day, it is necessary. This is of supreme significance in making sense of the passion, but its importance, it seems to me, is everywhere apparent in the gospel story. Jesus' history is his mission. Its purposive character is not something with which it is overlain by subsequent apostolic interpretation. It's rather, it is something recognised by the apostles as that by which it's given its inner coherence and bearing. 
Second, this official history of Jesus's, sorry, this official character of Jesus' human history takes place within Israel, within the covenant. Jesus is a Jew at that late and degenerate stage of the history of God's dealings with the people of God, which stems from the patriarchs, but which has now stumbled into its climactic episode. Jesus' human history is both the fulfilment of the covenant and its re-inauguration. His historical presence is God's covenant fidelity, I will be your God, and it is equally Israel's covenant fidelity, you will be my people. In this history, Jesus takes responsibility for his brothers and sisters by doing in their stead what they cannot do and by being what they cannot be, namely the children of God. Third, Jesus' human history is not directly perceptible. It emerges into visibility only as it evokes faith and confession of the divine movement by which it's born to us, its contemporaries. Jesus baffles those whom he meets. He's oblique and opaque. He's known only insofar as he bestows knowledge of himself, as he shows himself. And that showing is not identical with his mere material presence, but a willed radiance which alone illuminates the darkness by which Jesus is surrounded. Fourth, therefore, Jesus' human history is a prophetic history. Jesus speaks, and he's not simply an element in the world's distorted economy of communication. His word is authoritative because self-authored, wholly original and free. In the human speech of this man, there occurs an act of divine power. God's instruction, warning and promise are heard when he speaks. We have in him a new teaching with authority. Fifth, Jesus' human history is the decisive moment in the conflict between the kingdom of God and its opponents. It's decisive, first, because in Jesus' history, the opponents of God are finally unmasked. This, of course, is why he is accompanied by resentment. And it's decisive, second, because in it, God's kingly rule is established. Jesus is not just the herald of a lordship under whose rule he also exists. He is the ruler. All occasions and all creatures exist within the domain of his rule. His historical progress, the appointed course which takes him to Jerusalem, is the acting out of that rule. God's kingdom in Jesus Christ is an unchanging condition. Jesus doesn't need to struggle to make the kingdom come into being. He brings it to bear with divine force on what surrounds him. But it is, nonetheless, a kingdom which, in the course of Jesus' history, secures a victory. Because of this man, Satan falls. Six, Jesus' human history is an extended act of sin-bearing. By it, fellowship with God is restored. How can this be? Well, because it was the will of the Lord to bruise him. Because God the Father determines and God the Son consents to deal with human repudiation of the covenant by the Son's taking flesh, being born under the law, and in obedience to the Father, bearing in himself the full weight of sin and the full penalty which it draws upon itself. The life giver partakes of the same nature as those to whom he has given life, so that through death he might destroy him who has the power of death and deliver us from bondage. Jesus' human history is thus the work of a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. And seven, Jesus' human history is sufficient, complete, and in one real sense, closed. But there can be no repetition because none is needed. In its human historical character, he's perfect, fully realized, wholly effective. And because of this finality, all subsequent human history must look back to the fact that the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. The history of the world's earthly presence is an ontological perfectum. But eight, this isn't all that's to be said. For this finished history is also open at its further side. God has highly exalted this one. He has taken his seat at the right hand of the majesty on high. And because this is so, then the one who made himself present there and then is also present now. 
his presence in time does not bring time to a close. It fills it with hope and empowers its continuation through the Holy Spirit in the fellowship of the saints. The beloved Son is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And that last theme, the presence of the exalted Christ as the church's head, will form our material for the final two lectures. But let me close this one with a curious passage from Aquinas, which may draw us back to the chief point of today, which is the grounding of Jesus' incarnate history in the infinity of God. The passage is tucked away in Aquinas' discussion of the ceremonial law in the Prima Secundae, in the course of which he offers figurative interpretations of various commands surrounding the construction of the temple, including those rather curious commands from Exodus 20, An altar of earth you shall make for me, and you shall not go up by steps to my altar. Well, the literal sense is, of course, a prohibition of assimilation to Israel's cultic context, and Aquinas is quite aware of that. But he also finds a Christological reference. This is what he says. Christ is our altar, and we have to confess, as regards his humanity, the reality of his flesh that is, to make an altar of earth. As regards his divinity, we have to confess his equality with the Father, which is not going up by steps to the altar. See the point? We have to confess the reality of his flesh, otherwise there's no Emmanuel. There is no other altar but the altar of earth. But we cannot ascend to that altar by steps, for there is this altar of earth, only because of Christ's co-equality with God. Flesh heals us, Augustine says, but only because it is the Word made flesh. And we stop there, friends.